All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday and welcome to the Fort Worth Community Arts Center's newest edition of our Boxed Lunch program. So excited to be here, looking forward to another week. We have a very, very special guest with us today. So very excited to welcome and share lunch with the one and only Andrea Rogers. How you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. So looking forward to lunch and talking to you. So. Nice. Well, we are so very excited to have you. So grateful that you took the time. And before we delve into things, would you just be kind enough to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do. Okay. Um, Andrea L. Rogers, Dawadoa. Uh, my name is Andrea L. Rogers. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I said hello, everyone. And I have been a teacher in Fort Worth for the last nine years at Young Women's Leadership Academy, where I taught a little bit of everything. I taught introduction to engineering. I taught uh, pre-AP English too. And then finally, I got to teach my true love, which was art. Um, so for the last four or five years, I taught art for the middle school and high school. Um, during that time, I got an MFA in creative writing fiction at the Institute for American Indian Arts. And um, decided about a year ago that the next step was to get a doctorate, get, get my PhD. So there are a lot, not a lot of Native Americans with their PhD. Um, and so, you know, statistically, we're like 0.5% of the whole population. Wow. <laughs> so then when you look at those other statistics, there are very few of us that, you know, have that doctor in front of our name. And so I was working at the all girls school and the girls had gotten to see me get my master's, work full time, raise a family while I was getting my master's in uh, creative writing fiction. And um, I told them, you know, I really want my doctorate. And they were like, you should do it. We're gonna miss you, but you should do it. And um, I just thought it's a good example for those girls. It's a good example for my own children, um, for a woman to get her PhD. Um, and I'm doing writing. I write, I, center, I do writing that centers Cherokee people. Um, I write about Cherokee vampires and Cherokee werewolves, but I also do uh, historical fiction, which um, comes from my point of view as a native person. And so, um, you know, it's my job to, in my opinion, I was put on the earth to make more native content for native children and for other people so they can, you know, see history the way it really was and not um, the propaganda we grow up learning. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Well, happy Indigenous People Day to you and Thanks. also to all the Native Americans out there. Uh, special day. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit but I think it's just uh, very crucial and very important that people are aware. Uh, October 12th, so uh, uh, congratulations to you, not only on that, but also on your uh, uh, search for higher education. Uh, I guess we'll be calling you uh, Dr. Rogers fairly soon, yes? It'll be about four or five, four or five years, but yes, that's the, that's the plan. Well, it, it certainly gives you something to look forward to during these crazy times, I guess. <laughs> yep. Nice to have a roadmap. So, exactly. You know. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you're a, a native of Fort Worth and you're actually splitting your time, is that correct? Or actually you're from Tulsa, but you live in mm -hmm. Fort Worth and now mm -hmm. you're somewhere totally else, is that right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so I, I've been in uh, the DFW area for about 15 years. Uh, my husband is a teacher for uh, Dallas Public Schools. He also teaches for Tarrant County College as a historian. Um, he is not native. He um, teaches for Dallas Community College. And so he's still there teaching. Uh, my youngest daughter um, is 11 and she's going to school online there at the house. And then my oldest daughter is 22 and she's there at the house doing a certification program online. So they are all safe and well in Fort Worth in the house we've been in for the last 10 years. And um, I have a little apartment here in Fayetteville and I get so much done. <laughs> so, um, I've been doing a lot of writing. I teach two classes. 
um, um, I have a, I got a fellowship with the university, a doctoral fellowship, which was a huge honor. They don't give a lot of doctoral fellowships to majors, uh, you know, because there's a lot of research going on here. There's a lot of STEM. There's a lot of science. There's a lot of research. And so uh, the bulk of those kind, that kind of money usually goes to those students. So the fact that I was nominated uh, for a doctoral fellowship was a huge honor and that I got it was a, a even better. And so um, because that really helped me decide whether or not to do it, um, you know, whether or not I had to take out more student loans. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of people think Native Americans go to school for free and we don't. I mean, you know, I'm still paying off the University of Tulsa bachelor's degree I got a long time ago. <laughs> and so um, there are tribes who set aside money, but I'm Cherokee and we have, there are 330,000 enrolled Cherokees, uh, which means that's 330,000 people who um, they can trace their lineage back to uh, the Dawes Act, um, which was um, basically decided who was Cherokee, but that role was created by the Cherokee Nation because the Cherokee Nation knew who was Cherokee. And so the Cherokee tribe created a role and then the Dawes Commission came in and fact checked it, interviewed people, made sure it was accurate. So if you were, if your ancestors were part of the tribe back in 1906, then you can trace your lineage and be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation because wow. they are Cherokee. Great information, great information indeed. Um, just before we get into too many things, is there a, uh, is there a website or something where anyone who might be interested in uh, pursuing that lineage, uh, can you uh, uh, let us know what that is and we'll try to get a comment in the uh, okay. uh, Facebook yeah. Live as well? Sure, um, the Cherokee doc or, okay, so there are three federally recognized tribes that are Cherokee. And it's uh, Cherokee Nation, which is in Oklahoma, yep. which is what I'm a part of. Uh, the United Ketua Band, which is also in Oklahoma and, um, to be Katua, you have to prove that you're Cherokee, but I think they have a they have a blood quantum requirement. Cherokee Nation does not have a blood quantum requirement. Um, and so citizenship is based on whether or not your ancestors were part of the tribe in 1906. Um, and then the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians is out in North Carolina. And um, they so all those those three tribes all have websites. And so um, for, for if you're wanting to find out more about how to enroll as a Cherokee citizen, you can go to the Cherokee.org website. And there is, they have, there are so many resources. Um, for, yeah, so lots and lots of resources. So if you're interested in Cherokee culture, Cherokee language, um, my nation is, they put a lot of time, effort, and money into providing those resources. Awesome. We'll try to get some links in the uh, comment section as well for anybody that's interested in that too. So uh, great information and a wonderful opportunity for you to uh, uh, look a little deeper as to uh, uh, where you came from and more importantly, uh, uh, how to get yourself associated with some of those wonderful tribes as well. So, all right. Oh, can I add one more thing? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I had the best weekend. I have my Cherokee brother is a man named Katua Knight, and he's a fry bread maker and a meat pie maker. And um, actually, the, the what I'm making today, he made the dough for me. So, um, but he we were talking this weekend, and he's a speaker. So he's also te teaching me Cherokee, because I didn't grow up speaking Cherokee. My dad was sent to boarding school. My dad, you know, when you went to boarding school, you got that language beat out of you. Yes. And so... Um, you know, language is so important because without your ancestors and without your language, you know, you might as well not be Cherokee because that's what, you know, that's what makes us who we are. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's a, a lost art, some of those languages. And uh, unfortunately, I believe in some of the educational systems that was not uh, really uh, supported much. And so it's just a shame. And so we need to do all we can about making sure that that language stays alive. I think it's imperative and important. And uh, I remember myself studying uh, uh, Sequoia and the uh, alphabet uh, way back in uh, uh, Greenwood Elementary, I believe it was, in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Oh. So oh, wow. um, yes, I uh, spent some time down there when I was younger, uh, been to the Salagi many, many times. I, uh, I'm hopeful that it is still running 
and um, just uh, uh, just saw some amazing, amazing Native American performers. I remember that uh, so prominently in my childhood down there in that area. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I just uh, uh, can't express to you the importance of uh, keeping that language alive and uh, making sure that that uh, heritage and, and lineages is continuing to uh, be acknowledged and represented and supported most importantly. So um, great information there. So speaking, speaking of homemade fry bread, what is on your lunch menu today? Um, that is what I'm gonna make. Originally, uh, my go-to food is, I say, you know, my, you know, I might be a, a, an older woman, but um, my belly is a 12 year old child and I love nachos. Um, and so I make, you know, it's like, but I, you know, I make them and I grate the cheese and I put beans and onions and tomatoes and get a good salsa and lettuce and corn and everything on the nachos. And, and then I, I put them in the broiler and get that cheese really good and hot and melty and crispy. Uh, but I was talking to my friend this weekend and I said, well, I think I'm going to make nachos. And he, and I was like, but I kind of, it is Indigenous Peoples Day. It's a good day to be Indian. It's a good day to still be here and um, having children and continuing our traditions and uh, honoring our families. And I said, you know, maybe, maybe he said, well, what about fry bread? Because, I mean, he's, he's a master fry bread maker. And so um, fry bread gets a bad rap from some people because, you know, it's, it's fried dough and um, you will hear people argue about how well fried bread's not a traditional food and it's not I mean but it's the way we responded to colonization that's what we were forced to have was the flour and the we didn't know how to make coffee and so <laughs> what to do with those stupid beans so people boiled them because they were like what is this and so fried bread was the same way I mean they gave us flour and you know when we were forced off our land they gave us these crappy rations with bugs in them and they gave us flour and then we made something really good out of it. I mean, and so that is something that all the, a lot of the tribes, you know, have some version of that and it's a response to col um, colonization, yes. but, and it's not something you should eat every day, <laughs> but you know, neither are nachos, neither is pizza. <laughs> I mean, so that's what I'm making today is I'm going to make, um, I'm going to make Indian tacos or fry bread. So. Very nice, very nice. Well, it uh, looks absolutely delicious. I see a plate full of ingredients there. Mine's a little easier, so I'll go first, and then I'm gonna come back to you for the ingredients. I'm okay. doing a uh, barbecue sandwich today and some pasta salad, which I did make by hand, so all of the vegetables are fresh. Cut them all up and enjoyed it this weekend and thought it would be a nice uh, little lunch addition to my barbecued sandwich today. So I'm gonna start uh, heating up that barbecue. And while I do that, why don't you tell us uh, about some of the ingredients that not only go into the fry bread, but also what you're using to make your uh, tacos. All right, all right. So um, my recipe, my fry bread recipe is a secret. <laughs> Families keep uh, fry bread recipes a secret. Good but to know. But um, you can go to, sorry, let me check the website. Um, you can go online and order fry bread mix from Red Corn Native Foods, Red Corn Native Foods. And uh, the Red Corns are an Osage family in Oklahoma and they've had um, this fry bread, they, they make native foods and so you can go online and order from them. I know they sell it in some Walmarts and grocery stores. I know I've seen it in Texas and so, um, and then all the tribes, I mean, everybody makes it differently. I mean, just like your mama's biscuits, everybody makes them differently and everybody loves what they grew up eating. And so um, when I'd go to the, there's an Indian Methodist church in Dallas and um, we would, I'd go and there would be all kinds of traditional foods like fried pumpkin and corn soup, but everybody made it differently. And so the Choctaw have a fabulous website and Choctaw nation, you know, is close to Texas. Yep. And so I'm going to drive over there. The Chickasaw Nation is close to Texas, and they have websites, and they'll have YouTube videos about how to make it. So, um, you know, all kinds of great resources out there. Uh, it, the recipe is a secret, but you can find all kinds of recipes out there for it. Another great way to learn about the Native Americans. They don't give any secrets away, do they? <laughs> family right they're for family so yes. um, if you're meant to know about it you know not everything 
for everybody. So um, if you're meant to know it, you'll know it. But that Chick Chickasaw uh, Museum, close to Texas, we, okay, so I work for Fort Worth ISD and we have an American Indian Ed program. And so I would teach basket making um, and other arts and crafts there and teach stories, uh, you know, writing. And so we took the kids to the Chickasaw Museum, which is not far from, from Texas. Right. And so spend a day over there. It's beautiful. I don't know if they're open right now, but it's, it's just a beautiful place. They've, and it's got, you know, a great museum you can walk through and um, good. It, and they've got an Indian village, an old style village. And so it's a really great place to visit too. So. Yes, it's fantastic. I've uh, I've camped over there in that area a few times, and uh, they actually just did a lot of renovation in the last couple of years, and it's an absolutely beautiful facility, wonderful way to uh, spend some time and to uh, uh, engage with that kind of community. Yeah, the, the village there is absolutely incredible, and uh, uh, just some wonderful stuff. And they have that restaurant, so you yep. can go and have great dumplings and fry bread or Indian tacos. And uh, they made you a corn soup, I can't remember, but um, it was good. So see if they're open. It's a great day trip from Fort Worth over there. So. It really is. And I think the corn soup, I think they did that in the village in uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, actual huts that they had set up, it seems like. So um, just a really, really cool place. and. Uh, not very far at all, less than two hours, I believe. So nice. So now are you actually kneading the flour yourself? Well, um, he made the dough for me. And so he told me to burp it. Ah. <laughs> so he said, pull out a bisque, a size about the size of a biscuit, and then, you know, flatten it out. And then I'm going to drop it in my fryer. So nice. All right, well, while you're burping the bread, I'm, uh, I'm curious as to uh, um, how have you been uh, coping with the uh, COVID-19, not only as a writer, but um, obviously as a student and a teacher, it sounds like. How's that been going for you? Well, um, when it first started, I was an a art teacher um, there at Young Women's Leadership Academy. And so um, I was teaching art online and I found out I really enjoyed it. <laughs> and so um, there was something really nice about not having to do the commute, even though my commute was short, um, not having to load everything. I, I drug stuff to school for art all the time. I mean, I would walk out the door with three bags and come home with five. <laughs> and so I, you know, the fact that I could be in my office space where I had all my stuff, um, made it really easy for me to teach. Plus, our room was a little crowded. And so I would have to stand at the front of the room and demonstrate. And then I could not very well get around the room. And so um, teaching online um, helped for me. And, you know, it just made it was really easy. And I enjoyed it. So I'd stand there and talk for 45 minutes and they could put questions on um, if they turned their camera on so I could see them fine if they didn't fine. Um, and you know, I taught art and they could sit and then there were a couple of times where I'd say, well, you know, we've already, I've already showed you what to do for this week. So do you all want to stay and just make art while I sit here and talk? And they were like, yes, just keep talking and we're just going to sit here and draw. And, um, you know, so they, they needed that, um, that consistency. They needed, they needed me cause I'd been their teacher for half a year. And well, through March. And so, you know, they needed to know that somebody was there who cared about them and would listen to them and answer their questions. And, you know, so that, that did change. Now the problem, <laughs> the bad thing was my kids were home too, right? Cause they had to be online learning as well. And the dog, the dog was loud. And um, <laughs> so there were, there were, you know, some inconveniences, but, um, and then also uh, what I found was um, the interruptions made writing difficult. Um, I had always thought, you know, I had, I had gotten used to when I was an at-home mom, you know, I would write on the go. And, and um, you know, I just, I could write anywhere. I could write, write, feed my baby or read a book, feed my baby and then sit down and write. And so I just fit it in everywhere. But um, 
but that when, when you're trying to focus on working on a book and the kids are fighting in the hallway, that, that really made writing a little more difficult. So that's where I miss the office. That's where I miss being able to drive away <laughs> where I could focus after work as an adult and work on something creative. Sure, sure. Now, um, I'm curious, you talk about writing. I want to talk about one book in specific because we're so close to Halloween and oh, yeah. I'm so inspired that you were able to uh, uh, not only continue to uh, share knowledge about um, uh, uh, the indigenous people, you've got a book, I believe it's uh, short stories called Man-Made Monsters. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. Right now, it's still just a manuscript. Um, we're trying to figure out how I have an agent named Emily Sylvan Kim with Prospect Agency. And so she likes the stories, but our short story collections are harder to sell unless yeah. you're already a, a well known author. And so um, we're still playing with that manuscript a lot. Um, some of those, uh, actually, five or six of those stories have been published other places. And one that is totally inspired by Fort Worth is called Me and My Monster. And it, uh, you can Google my name or Me and My Monster and Transmotion, T-R-A-N-S-M-O-T-I-O-N. And it comes out of the University of Kent. Uh, Theo Ben Alst is one of the editors of it. And um, it's about Goat Man. It's about a, a girl who has, it's about a summer romance and a goat boy and a girl. I got to read it at the Fort Worth Public Library a few years ago when Glennis Robinson was the director. Right. and. Uh, there was an event and she invited me to read and uh, me and a couple other Fort Worth authors were there and that was a good time, but it's called Me and My Monster. It's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> so um, you can Google that though. Um, so uh, basically, you know, I center Cherokee people. I mean, all of my characters are, are Cherokee and some of them also happen to be vampires and werewolves. Wow, it's really cool for Halloween. We'll look that up and see if we can't get a great goat boy story. <laughs> yeah. right, I'm gonna well, step um, off a second, my eyes are watering. Absolutely, yeah. you bet. It looks like you uh, just cut those onions just right. <laughs> yep, yep, they're, they're good, they're good onions. There's nothing wrong with those. <laughs> they can do their job. So I've got <laughs> my stuff to put on top of my taco and I'm gonna oh, make just, some just looks absolutely delicious. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little line here to uh, move you away from those onions on in a second. Uh, okay. Now you had talked about um, uh, writing. Can you uh, discuss a little bit uh, for me, some of your uh, mentors and uh, teachers oh. and yep. um, how did they inspire you and what kind of stories led you to writing? Okay. Um, well, when I was growing up, um, you know, there weren't any books by Native people. Um, and so, well, and if they were, you know, they were like animal stories. And so that was what publishing wanted when I was growing up. And so I couldn't find books that were about people who looked like me. They didn't have families who looked like me. Um, you know, we didn't have a Native American Judy Bloom. We didn't have, a, you know, we didn't have a Native American Super Fudge. And so um, when I had kids, I, you know, you start looking around for books for them and you see that there's nothing out there by people who look like you. And I had wanted to be a writer from second grade on. And my father always encouraged me. And so um, he was a musician. And so he encouraged my reading. He would buy me books all the time. Uh, what, you know, he didn't know what to buy me, but he'd take me the, to, I can't remember the store that was in the mall then. Um, I don't think it was Barnes and Noble, but he'd take me and I'd stay in the mall bookstore all day and read books. And then he, you know, I'd have some money and I'd buy a few books. And so um, my father encouraged my reading, which without the reading, you don't have the writing. And so um, let's see. Um, so I ended up, um, I was listening to a podcast and I found out that there was a master's of uh, fine arts, creative writing, fiction. Um, cause I was listening to this podcast and that podcast, I was telling myself, well, this is my master's. Okay. So, um, cause at that time I wasn't aware of any that were native American focused. And so I, um, looked up the masters of fine arts and creative writing fiction at IAIA. And, um, 
I applied and I got enough of a scholarship that I could afford it uh, from the Lannan Foundation. And so um, it wasn't cheap and it wasn't free, but it was cheaper and I could afford it. And, and so um, I went uh, like one week every semester and then everything else was online. And you may have heard of some of the people who graduated before me. Tommy Orange graduated uh, two years before I did. And Therese Myatt graduated uh, two years before I did. Wow. And so I was really lucky because my second year, my very last semester I was there, Tommy came back and taught. And so he and Pam Houston were my thesis advisors. And so, and Tommy's an amazing writer. Um, and he's, he's an amazing reader. And so I don't know how often he gets to teach anymore because he's really busy. Um, and he's, uh, but he was my um, mentor my last semester, and he was the first person that read my short story collection all the way through. And even though it's fiction, even though it's about vampires and werewolves, sometimes you really get to know somebody when you read their fiction. You don't know what's made up and what's not, but you, get, you could get to know someone pretty well sometimes when you read their fiction. And so Tommy Orange was the first person to read my whole collection all the way through. And um, his advice was, it, it was, it was right on target. Um, so Tommy is definitely someone I look up to. Um, when I first got there, I read a story um, about zombies. Um, and so um, my professor, one of my professors, Tony Jensen, who's a Métis writer, whose family, I guess, was from Alberta. She's, um, she's a teacher here at the University of Arkansas. She's how I ended up here. And she's a fabulous writer. Her book, Carrie, just came out. And I think it was the very first book the Goop Book Club did. Nice. Um, and they're doing right now called Carrie, C-A-R-R-Y. And it's, it's such a, you know, it's a memoir and essay. Good stuff. I've read most of her stuff. Uh, Therese Myatt's Heartberries is a memoir that was coming out about the same time Tommy's book came out. Also, just an amazing book. Her last name is spelled like male hot, but it's Therese Myatt. Um, so rhymes with Hyatt. Um, her book was Heartberries. So good. Um, before that, I had been reading, I think, Tim Tingle, Louise Erdrich, of course. Um, so I've been reading their work. Um, but when I was at IA and I read my zombie story, Tony Jensen came up to me and she said, we need to get you in a room with Stephen Graham Jones because he and another professor of mine had said the same thing. Manuel Gonzalez, who's another fabulous writer, um, had said the only person doing the thing that you want to do, which is write, you know, Indian werewolves and um, is Stephen Graham Jones. And so I was like, how have I not heard of this guy? Well, he's, he's Blackfeet. He's from Texas. He grew up in West Texas. He and his family were like the only Blackfeet around. And he'd been writing for 25 years, and I had never heard of him. And so I had to go to Santa Fe, New Mexico to find out about Stephen Graham Jones. And so I've read everything he's written. He's written like 25 novels. Wow. Or 22 novels, story collections. Yeah, it's, it's a deep collection. Um, and so actually the first thing I read um, was, let me grab it. Uh, where is it? Um, it is a, I know I brought it over here. Hang on, I can't see it. Oh, there it is. The Faster Redder Road. And Theo Van Alst uh, put up a collection of Stephen's work together. And so if you don't know what you want to read from Stephen Graham Jones, this is a good collection to get because it's got, you know, something from like every, chronologically every era. And so his new one, The Only Good Indians, is doing really well right now. It's a fabulous book. He's got a real fun one. Well, fun. <laughs> as far as horror can be fun, he's got Night of the Mansions, which is a novella. It's a, it's a lighter book. It's not the only good Indians, but they're both great. Um, and that's just, that is one thing that has been a problem for Native Americans is people want us to just like write those secrets that we were talking about. And yep. that's not, you know, I'm not going to perform being in Indian for people. Um, I'm going to write about my, my people, my dad, my life, my experience. And um, sometimes they're going to be, they're going to turn into werewolves. <laughs> but, um, and so it's been a lot, it's been hard to get that kind of stuff out there. Um, sure. Because that wasn't what publishers thought they wanted. The reality yeah. is now that it's out there though, people, people are reading it. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I also think that it's uh, imperative that I share this as well. You are not just a ghost story writer as well. You also have some children's <laughs> stories, I believe, and also some uh, Me Too stories and uh, essays yep. as well. Yep. Let me grab those. So, ooh. I think it's very interesting that you talked about uh, uh, searching for those stories when you were younger and then uh, did that inspire you at all in your uh, uh, children's book? Yeah, it absolutely did. Um, because um, I wrote, let's see, I wrote this one for Capstone. Uh, my friend um, Tracy Sorrell is a fabulous writer and I'll show some of her books later. But I had started a Native American critique group um, using Twitter. Debbie Reese, who's a Native American writer, thinker, um, critic of, of stere bad stereotypes in Native writing. Uh, boosted it for me. And so I started a Native American critique group. So Tracy is part of that. Tracy has done really well. She's, she's doing, she was doing the same thing I did for the same reason. She went out and tried to find books for her son. And, you know, there are no books by Cherokees about what happened to us. And the amazing thing about that is, uh, you know, you know, of course, that we had a written language. We were writing stuff down. We have our own records. And so um, the fact that this is the first book put out by a bigger publisher about the Trail of Tears by a Cherokee artist in 20, you know, came out January 2020. And, you know, why, you know, so there just aren't books by us about us. And there's this great quote that Theo Van Alst used, and I think he got it from Ireland. Uh, it's, you know, anything about us without us is not for us. And... You know, that's just how it is. <laughs> so this is Mary Trail of Tears. Uh, it came out from Capstone. It's available hardback, library edition. It's also available in paperback. And it's also available now on ebook. So you can get it on your Kindle. Um, and so to do that book, I had, I had never been back to our, our land. I'd never been back to Georgia or Tennessee or North Carolina. I'd never been there. And so I... Um, Got the contract in like January and I put together um, a chapter outline and I wrote them back and I said, well, I know that this is my deadline, but could I have an extra two weeks? Cause I just don't feel like I can write about where we're from unless I go there. And so <laughs> spring break, Friday night, spring break, we loaded, I loaded the family up in the car. My two youngest, I have a middle daughter who's going to school up at Fort Lewis in uh, Durango, Colorado, but she was still home then. So I loaded her and Angie and my husband and we loaded in the car and we drove, you know, we drove the Trail of Tears backwards. Wow. So we uh, you know, swung back through Arkansas and Oklahoma and then um, headed to Cherokee, North Carolina, because I knew that that's where the Eastern Band was. And so I got there and um, you know, that area is just beautiful. And I went to the Eastern Band Museum, neat museum, very nice. Um, and then... I had talked to uh, my researcher, Twyla Bards, and she was like, you've got to go to Nui Choda. You can't do this book without going to Nui Choda. And I was like, oh, well, you know, that should have been obvious to me, but it wasn't. I, I had the same classes everybody else did. And so I you know, had learned a lot of my history in those same classes. And so I went to, New we went to Nui Choda. And I don't know if, I don't know if you can there, but um, that's where our um, that's where our capital was in Georgia. Um, that's where a lot of treaties were uh, talked about and argued about. We had it was a town. It was Athens, Rome for the Romans. It our capital, and people then Cherokees lived out around it. And so that's where the council houses were. There were schoolhouses. That's where the printing press was. Um, and so. That's where our newspaper was printed. And so our newspaper was, there were subscribers for our newspaper in France and England. So when all this stuff happened, where Andrew Jackson and then the next president um, were taking our land, people in Europe were looking and they were, um, there was actual fear by the governor um, of Georgia that, you know, it might send a navy. <laughs> because people in Europe were looking at what was happening to us and how our, our land was being taken 
And it wasn't just the taking of land, there were men coming in and robbing Cherokees. And there was nothing a Cherokee could do about it because the federal said that um, a native could not uh, go to court against a white person. They could not witness against a white person. And so the laws, uh, you know, Georgia was doing all kinds of illegal things uh, to force us out. And so, um, so I had to go to New Echota. So we went to New Echota and um, then we traveled back uh, on the Trail of Tears for some ways, the Northern Trail, because there were several different trails. Right. And I realized, understand how long it took, you know, because you, you learn the force on the Trail of Tears and you think, okay, well, they were routed up. No, there were five months of internment camps. And just like you hear about internment camps, you know, yep. classic, not enough shelter, uh, the food, the food you round a thousand people up and you have to a lot of food. <laughs> that's a lot of water. And yes. that's a lot of uh, places where people have to go to the place. So you've got to keep the place clean. And if it's not clean, you've got sick. So they were rounded up. Um, one of the the Kinjins family was on, they were in that internment camp for five months. And so they were sick, they were weak, um, and you know they had been taken from their homes without adequate clothing. And then they were forced to walk 1,000 miles. And so, and so that lasted nearly a year. I mean, so it was not just round them up, put them on wagons, get them out of here. It was, right. it was bad. <laughs> so, and yeah. I didn't understand. How bad it was and so to be on that be to see that with daughters to know that my ancestors this is what they went through so I could be here and now I have others who are here um, you know that was that I put my heart in this book and yeah. so um, anyway so so it is historical um, the protagonist is a, a girl but um, it's eminently readable if you don't know the history of the Trail of Tears. Um, Theo had read it and he said, you know, adults can read it too. And it's a quick read maybe, but you'll learn a lot. So. Nice. Now, um, now some of this may seem pretty uh, uh, simple and obvious to uh, most people out there, but I think it's important to continue to uh, uh, spread this message. Can you talk a little bit about why you feel Indigenous Peoples Day is important, and what are some of the ways that we can all help celebrate? Oh, um, let's see. It's important because um, I think the the there are 574 really recognized tribes in the U.S. and most of us, um, and we're all different, and so. You know, that's a lot of people to learn about. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, imagine if we had a book every year by one writer from each tribe. I mean, you know, that would begin to make a dent on how important representation is. Um, but it's just, it's, um, it's important because we need to know history. <laughs> so one of the things that, that always, when I, I met with a class, um, a, young class, a uh, third grade class and over my book. And they said, you know, why, why did people kill the Cherokees? Why did white people hate the Cherokees? And it, it's, um, you know, it boiled down to greed. It boiled down to, you know, money. It boiled down to, you know, treating people like they weren't human so you could take their stuff. And so that's, um, and it's also important to recognize that treaty law is the way this country was established. Yep. And so it's all Indian land. <laughs> it was all Indian land. And so basically real contracts happened in order to take deeds to land um, that was being taken. So those treaties, you know, so the U.S., the federal government has 574 different kinds of treaties, um, you know, and every every native nation gets to decide who to be a citizen of their tribe. And so there's a lot of things people don't understand about the law, the treaty law, law of the right. land, and it really should supersede agreements states make. It should see, uh, supersede any law because treaty law is land that we're so, and then also just um, that it's in people's day, 
you know, that there are indigenous people right now who are suffering in the camps. Those people from Guatemala and those countries further south, a lot of those people are worried, a lot are, are indigenous. And um, those people are being forced off their land too. And so it's not, it's not, a, it's not a totally past thing. And yeah. even in Oklahoma right now, there's stuff going on uh, related to the recent Supreme Court decision that said, oh yeah, we've never gotten rid of, you know, the, <laughs> it's still Indian territory. <laughs> and so legislators are negotiating to, to take away or have, to take away a tribe's right to decide if there can be illegal, be dumping on their land, if they can loot the land, if they can take the mineral rights and the mineral resources. Um, and so Oklahoma is still, it's still trying to steal from the Indians. Yeah, it's crazy for sure. Um, you, you would think that uh, after all this time, um, uh, we would just, just simply not only be uh, uh, aware of other, uh, people's uh, opinions and, and uh, it's just beyond me how we continue to uh, do the same things over and over again, even when uh, uh, we're becoming more aware and uh, more involved in uh, uh, trying to uh, equalize people's rights. And it's just, uh, it's crazy, <laughs> absolutely well, crazy. Yeah, and, abs and, and that's where representation is so important. That's where telling stories from a native point of view um, are so important. There's a wonder, and, and I'm, now I'm going to reverse that though. There's a wonderful book called Conquest of Texas, um, I think. Tech Conquest, it's by Gary C. Anderson. I checked it out at the Fort Worth Public Library. He's a professor at the University of Oklahoma. And so he, he talks about how Texas was, was formed, and there were tribes in Texas, lots and lots of tribes. And now there's only like three federally recognized tribes and a couple of state tribes. And I learned so much from, you know, and there were Cherokees in Texas because there were Cherokees who fled and moved to Texas and were friends with Sam Houston and he tried to get them land there in Texas and that ended up not working out. I mean, so there were Cherokee massacred outside of Dallas, yes. uh, around Dan County, Chief Bowles and his people, they were fleeing and they were chased by Texas Rangers and they were murdered. And so, Gary C. Anderson's book is so good um, because, and because, like I said, I grew up in the same schools everybody else went to. I learned my history the same way everybody did, but um, I missed out on a lot of my own people's history, and I, I learned things that weren't quite right. And so I learned sure. so much about what was going on in Texas. So it's such a good book, um, and what he points out is you know people historians love primary sources right and yeah. you sort of think oh because it was written back then it must be right and he's like you know this these were secondhand reports about you know calling the Karanka was cannibals there's a great book a uh, graphic novel i'm going to grab it put out by the dallas um holocaust and human rights museum yep. called our land and oh, it's right. about the persecution Karankawa Indians in Texas because I mean genocide was committed against the Karankawa they were wiped out because people wanted their land and so they they were called cannibals when they weren't necessarily cannibals um, you know lies were told in order to justify uh, the dehumanization of somebody so you could take their stuff yeah. and you know that's a lesson I think for all of us for because it still happens yeah, for sure. Um, we'll make sure and do all we can to get those uh, uh, resource links up for those great stories. If we miss something, make sure you uh, circle back around to the comments and uh, please share any and all uh, uh, insight you might have for us to uh, uh, continue to educate and uh, inform ourselves about these uh, extremely important topics. So, all right. So how's your lunch coming there? Um, <laughs> I think I'm about ready to plate it. So All right. grab, grab my taco. Um, oh yeah, and you know, the Dallas Holocaust Museum has done all these major renovations and um, it's super awesome. <laughs> so um, they have an exhibit on the Karankawa there um, because you know, they have the thing on the, the stages of genocide, 10 stages of genocide. And you know that hits really close to home because I'm sure that there are still teachers uh, teaching Texas history 
who um, could maybe, you know, take a class to that exhibit to see yeah. what really happened to the Kronk was. And anyway, so it, it's, it's also got um, other, other um, peoples who were um, targeted for extinction. And so it's a great exhibit. I was really pleased it was that close to home. Awesome, awesome. So speaking of renovations, uh, how do you see the arts adapting? I'm assuming that as a novelist, you've kind of been isolated when you write. Sounds like you might've had some of your uh, family kind of circle into that writing area, but how do you see the arts adapting through all of this? You know, uh, there, you know, it's really hard to find something where um, you don't went, get a look, you don't, you know, it's that whole silver lining thing. Um, because I, I love to go watch writers. I love to go watch writers read. I love to be able to be in conversation with writers. Um, right now I am taking a, a continuing ed class taught by Byron Aspas at um, the Institute for American Indian Arts on Tuesday and Thursday nights. And it's about writing creative, writing nonfiction. And I'm getting to do that via Zoom. I have wanted to take some of their continuing ed classes for years, but I don't live in Santa Fe. <laughs> and so now I can. And so a friend of mine who's in Denver, who's a, a poet, Melanie Archuleta, she and I are taking the class together and that wouldn't have happened a year ago. And um, I can, I can, you know, we're, we're really finally using using um we're finally using the internet in a way that's really positive sure. um i think writer there's a group called writing on writers on writing i think pam houston is part of that and i got to watch a writer um do a book called the center of all beauty i mean so i got to see paul tremblay who's a horror writer um read one of his short stories one night uh, from a museum i mean not a museum a library up i think it's called the sturgis writers uh, but it's a library, and I think in Connecticut, I got to watch him read. And so, wow. you know, you can kind of get overwhelmed by how many things there are that you can't do. But I, um, I'm, I go to a thing called Quelly in New York City, and um, we had the Quelly, uh, and I've read. That's where I read Goatman there, uh, me and my monster. And um, of course, they had to go virtual this year. But there were people who were lived in Thailand, and Quelly is, um, it's, it's really a writer's conference for people of color who have historically not been able to get into the publishing industry. So people, there were people who lived in Thailand who could attend that conference. And, you know, some barriers to access are being removed, sure. whether it's um, something that keeps you from being able to travel easily because of uh, a health issue, um, and so some barriers of access are going away and that's fabulous. I mean, to be able to visit a museum virtually and see things, I mean, so, I mean, I don't want the in-person stuff to go away forever because of this, but um, the fact that I can take a class at the Institute for American Indian Arts on Tuesday and Thursday night without leaving my house is pretty awesome. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now you've talked about a lot of uh, references and books and stories and authors. What sort of um, community resources are you seeing or using personally? And how can your uh, uh, organization or just indigenous people in general be assisted or provide assistance to other artists or organizations? Mm -hmm. um, there is, in Dallas, there's an American Indian Heritage Day group, and they do a lot of, there's a, they, they do a lot of things that are educational um, about American Indians, um, especially there in Texas, because I don't know how many people know this, but in the 1950s, there was an Indian Relocation Act, and so a lot of Indians showed up there in Dallas. And um, that's how the Urban Indian Methodist Church started. And so Peggy Larney and her son Brian Larney have, um, they're on, they're, it's under American Indian Heritage Day, but they got American Indian Heritage Day started in Texas. Wow. They, they got a bill passed that, uh, and I can't remember what day it is, <laughs> but um, so American Indian Heritage Day is recognized in Texas. And that's amazing because, you know, Texas really tried to kill all the Indians and run them out. You either, they ran them off, <laughs> go back to Indian territory, or they killed them. 
And so um, the that that is recognized in Texas as a big deal, American Indian Heritage Day. And then they also support, there's a missing murdered indigenous women's group um, there in Dallas. And uh, gosh, I can't remember the woman's name, but um, a lot of times you'll, you can follow both of them on Facebook and see, you know, support those organizations. Um, publishers are responding and, and with representation in some cases. And so there's Harbor Collins, um, has a new imprint called Heart Drum. And one of the managing editors is Cynthia Litek Smith, and she lives in Austin. She's Muskogee Creek, she grew up in Kansas City, um, became a lawyer, and now she's a writer. She's got a lot of books out there. Cynthia Litek, L-E-I-T-I-C-H Smith. And she's, um, Heart Drum is a thing now. Heart Drum is native books by native writers. And actually I'm developing a book on wild onion dinners um, a picture book for a heart drum. And so hopefully we'll be able to announce soon when we have an illustrator and everything's all good to go. But heart drum, they've, they've got a lot of books coming out in the future. And I actually have a short story called The Ballad of Maggie Wilson, which is in an antho powwow anthology they have coming out next year um, called Ancestor Approved. So, and it's all these, all stories that are interlinked at a powwow, um, by native writers and so it's called ancestor approved heart drum and they've signed a lot of they've signed a lot of writers um cherokee writer tracy sorrell um is let, i'm gonna grab her books just a second Ooh. these are all cherokee writers um so she wrote we are grateful with ochala hiliga which is also it's um has cherokee language stuff in it um, and she's, she's been one of my mentors. Art Colson is also another Cherokee writer. Um, Tracy wrote this one at the mountain's base and there's a version of it that's being printed. Um, who's it from? Sorry, just a second. Is it Penguin? Yeah, it's from Coquila Press, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. So there's a version of it with Cherokee language. Um, oh, for, let's see. This is one of my favorite books. So um, it's, a, it's a book about a family of Indian werewolves, but it never says the word Indian, I think. And so it really, it's uh, like a young adult book, Mongols by Stephen Graham Jones. Um, it came out from, who is that? Sorry, it is from William Morrow, HarperCollins. And so um, HarperCollins is, they're doing a lot of stuff, mapping the interior, not for children, but a really good horror novel, novella. Um, Where the Dead Sit Talking by Brandon Hobson, uh, Johnny Appleseed, hold on just a second, by Joshua Whitehead. Oh, the First Nation stuff. Man, I, I had to go to Santa Fe to learn about Canadian Native writers. And so Eden Robinson came and taught there, and she's got a book called, a trilogy called Trickster Drift, I think, and they're making um, a a mini series of it, Trickster by Eden Robinson. She's fabulous. Joshua Whitehead is also a native person from Canada. And Sheree Dimeline is, uh, did an apocalypse book. You know, so there are a lot, we're, we're getting to do our work. <laughs> so awesome. um, we're getting to do some writing and getting to see these. So buy their books though, that's it. Just buy, buy books by native writers. Um, yep, that's it. But, and then also with the arts, I mean, you know, support like the Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. I mean, they have foundations, they need money. <laughs> and so if you can support a native artisan, like, um, so like I have earrings, which I think were made by the Choctaw tribe came to the IAI powwow for graduation. I bought my earrings from them. Um, there's, you know, support, there's lots of artists on Instagram or Facebook, um, you know, and just buying some earrings from them can help support the native arts. Absolutely, for sure. And get the Buy message books out for your there life. as well. Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about that yeah. shirt so, I mean, oh, as well? Oh, yeah. Totally forgot. Yeah, so this is my, my one of my favorite shirts. So um, it, people will see it and they're oh, I love the wild things. And I'm like, well, it's not really quite it. Oh. But um, so we've got the, this is like the first story. This is like the first horror story on this continent, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where the Nina and the Pinta show up. 
And so, um, you know, he's at the campfire tying this monster, and there's something way scarier out there. Um, and so if you're not aware <laughs> of um, how monstrous um, Columbus's assault on the Tainos was, um, I mean, just go to the Library of Congress and read, read his own accounts where he says basically, gosh, these people are so peaceful and loving and they gave us all this stuff. We would be nuts not to enslave them. And so, I mean, that's, you know, and that's how, you know, and that's, that's facts. Those are facts. Those are his own words. <laughs> and so um, the way that people were there and the indigenous people were treated, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's all there. So, oh, and one other book that I, I just, or two other books, I have so many books that I love, but, um, you know, a classic is Angie Debo's and Still the Waters Run. Uh, so if, if you want to learn about Indian territory, um, this is a good book for uh, Cherokee Stories, the Turtle Island Liars Club by Christopher Tuton. And he's, it's just, he interviewed storytellers, Hastings Shade, Sammy Still, Sequoia Guests, and Woody Hanson. Um, that's Heart Berries. Uh, but this one is good. Um, an indigenous, if you want to learn about it, about, you know, the history of this country, an indigenous people's history of the United States for young people. And it's an adaptation of Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's seminal work. And it's adapted by G. Mendoza, Mendoza and Debbie Reese. It's got great lessons in it. It's got great resources. Um, it's, a really, it's a really great book. Fantastic information, for sure. Okay, so um, are you all plated up or are you still getting ready? I am. All right, now here's probably <laughs> the most important question I'm gonna ask you on this interview, then we'll show off our food. How and where can we follow, find, and keep up with your work? Oh. Um, I have a website. It's, um, and I can never remember if it's an org or a com. Um, so it is, it's Man Made Monsters, um, the site for AndreaLRogers.com. So it's AndreaLRogers.com is my website. But really, the best place is Twitter. Because Twitter is where I will announce work. I will uh, announce the work I support. I'll announce. I'll put links for um, artists that need, you know, financial support, um, political causes. So Andrea L. Rogers on Twitter. Um, that's my children's writer. Um, that's where I. That's where I drop things all the time. So that is probably the best place because the blog is a little out of date. Um, you had asked about another piece, and that was I have an essay in this. Um, it's called You Too, 25 Voices Share Their Me Too Story. So that's a young adult essay. Um, and then I have, let's see. Ah, and then I've got a bunch of short stories out there. Oops, they're online. Um, and like Waxwing, I had a story called Ghost Cat that came out, uh, I want to say in February. So Waxwing, if you've heard of that literary journal. Uh, Yellow Medicine Review. Um, I've got a short story in that one. Um, the Santa Fe Literary Review. I'm going to have one in the Massachusetts Review soon. So nice. That's Incredible. where I'm going to update stuff usually. Hats but off. Twitter. I don't. You're everywhere. Work. <laughs> <laughs> and I write everything. So I do. I do historical fiction, but I also want to write about werewolves. And so. I think that's how you keep art alive, is you expand yourself and spread out. So, wow, so much information. I tell you, I'm starving now. I'm worn out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see that lunch. Let's see how things turned out there. Come up close to the camera here so we can see all that beautiful stuff. Awesome. Just looks delicious. Mine's not near as pretty. But I am going to brag on that pasta salad a little oh. bit there. <laughs> I, think that, I think that looks yummy. But... Well, hopefully it will be. Okay. Well, do you have any final uh, comments or uh, uh, any kind of insight for the public out there before we uh, wrap up and enjoy our lunch? Um, just, you know, keep reading Native artists. I mean, keep reading Native writers. So, um yeah, support Native writers. Tell your library you want books. Um, years ago, before 
nobody knew who Stephen Graham Jones was here either very much. And so um, a couple of years ago, you know, he had written 22 novels and short story collections. And I went to the library and I could find one. And so I turned in a list. I was like, you need these books, but you can do that too. Turn in a list to your local library and tell them to buy uh, books by Brandon Hobson or Theo Van Alst. Um, tell them, you know, Tim Tingle. He's, all, oh gosh, this writer, I can't believe I left her out. So the trail at the Buffalo Ranch, this is by Sue, Sarah Sue Hoplatubby and she is Cherokee but they're just like cozy mysteries. And so if you ask for them, people will buy them and then publishers will be more likely to buy the books. Johnny Appleseed, I mentioned, Sacred Smokes um, by Theo Van Alst, um, Cherie Demolines, Mar oh, and this book is coming out soon. Um, a lot so, or no, it came out by Darcy Little Badger and she's Lee Pan. So, you know, the Lee Pan are a state tribe of Texas. They were there, definitely, um, they just, <laughs> They didn't, they lost out on being federally recognized because they were in Texas and Texas was its own country. So that's a good book. My 11 year old loved it. Uh, I mentioned Shree Dimeline. So yeah, ask for these books though, because if you ask for these books, libraries will buy them. And if libraries buy them, then publishers will keep asking us to run those stories for sure. Very, very important. Wow, just some fantastic information and uh, what looks to be an absolutely beautiful lunch there as well. I'm so jealous that I'm not there to share that with you in person. I, uh, I'm gonna look you up whenever you're back down here in Fort Worth and things are safe, and uh, maybe we can uh, enjoy each other's company in person. I would love to hear you read a story, and so uh, save one for me, and uh, my ears are yours, my friend. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that does it for another episode of Box Lunch. Again, happy Indigenous Peoples Day to all out there. Uh, please do some research, inform yourself, educate yourself, and most importantly, be kind to yourself and to others. Andrew, it's been a pleasure. I just can't thank you enough for taking the time. And uh, hopefully we'll shake each other's hands soon. And uh, with that being said, Jason Leva with the Fort Worth Community Arts Center. We want to say bon appetit to everybody. We'll be back again next week with a new episode. And again, Andrea, thanks so much for joining me. Be safe out there, everybody. Have a great day, okay? Bye-bye. Wadon. Wadon. Wadon.